All right, for today's critical thought, we're going to be discussing the lock and key model when it comes to puzzle design and philosophy. Now, puzzle design in video games is a multifaceted topic and covers a very wide spectrum. From Towers of Annoy, uh, Mustache Cats, Pushing Block Puzzles, Scrambling Puzzles, Word Puzzles, Number Puzzles, you name it. There's just a, so much to cover here. But, whatever the case may be and whatever the design you're trying to build around, it's important to understand what the lock and key principle means when it comes to balancing and presenting a puzzle to a player. Now, when we discuss this actual model, the term we're using lock and key to describe puzzle design originates from game designer Ron Gilbert, who is famous for, of course, being a part of the team behind Maniac Mansion, Curse of Monkey Island, and probably most recently with Gary Winnick, they designed the game Thimbleweed Park, which was a throwback to that 80s, 90s era of adventure games. So, he certainly knows a thing or two about creating puzzles. But, when he discussed puzzle design, whether it was on GDC or on his blog, he refers to puzzles as a combination of locks and keys. The locks being what's stopping you or what's in your way, and the key is what you need to do to get past it. And he relies a lot, or he discussed the idea behind puzzle dependency charts, wherein you kind of see from top to bottom what you're doing in order to solve this puzzle. And you can throw in or remove different steps depending upon what play testing and what the overall difficulty of your game is. So let's say, for instance, that I want to break into a bank and I need to get through the front door. Now obviously there's no keys here, so the first part of this puzzle would be to find something to break the door down with. Let's say I find a crowbar, but oh no, the crowbar is stuck in a shed and I need to get into that place. Well, I need to find the guy who has the key to the shed. But wait, this guy is not going to give me that key, so I need to figure out a way to knock him out or steal them. So I need to look around for those solutions. And then what happens is you're kind of retracing your steps back to that original puzzle. But the point is, at each step of this puzzle chain, the player is given an idea as to what they're looking for, what's stopping them, and hopefully what tools they have to work with. And those three statements are going to come into play in a minute when we switch to our game footage. But it's very important to be able to present these puzzles to the player in a way that they know that it's actually a puzzle and that they have an idea as to what their end game is. It's very often in a lot of confusing games where you don't even know what solution you're trying to go for. There may be some weird thing standing in your way or a monster, but am I supposed to kill it? Am I supposed to befriend it? Am I supposed to take it out for dinner and then leave it at the restaurant, you know, dine and dash? I don't know. And this is one of the issues that a lot of puzzle designers face. And when we've talked about before with the idea of internal logic versus designer logic. Internal logic means that the world itself gives you its own set of rules and constraints that it's built upon, and it's up to you to figure out how things work in relation to that. And hold on one second. Sorry about that, I had to get the phone. But back to the topic at hand. Internal logic versus designer logic. While the internal logic is built on the rules that you've set forward, and this is a major part of Immersive Sims, Breath of the Wild, Prey 2016, and so on, Designer logic means that you're creating a puzzle or a situation that is entirely built on whatever logic you have at hand for that specific situation. So, if I set the solution to be, you must tap dance singing in the rain in front of a door to open it, then that's the solution to this puzzle. Does it make sense within the world? Probably not. Does it make sense in our world? Definitely not. But if that's the solution that you define, then that's the solution to the puzzle. And designer logic puzzles are very looked down upon by uh, expert ex adventure game designers and consumers because this is when we get into that strategy guide design focus where you're not trying to solve this puzzle using what you have. The only way you're going to know how to solve this puzzle is you need to think like the developer or read their strategy guide that they put out. 
And again, it goes back to what I just said a minute ago regarding those three points. And we're going to switch to some game footage and talk about how the lock and key principle applies, even if you're talking about some insane or very abstract concept. Alright, so this is footage from the Dark Side Detective, an indie adventure game built on a 2D pixel style, as you can see here. And this is a great example of that classic adventure game design and what we've been discussing when it comes to the idea of lock and key puzzle philosophy. Now, what you're going to see on screen will most likely spoil this first case, but considering this was part of the demo, that is perfectly fine. But, with adventure games like the Dark Side Detective, the whole idea is that we're dealing with the logic of the world itself. And in this game, you're going to be fighting zombies, going to parallel dimensions, and dealing with evil gremlins in an upcoming chapter. And obviously, those are elements that we don't have experience with in real life. But the game presents everything within the rules of the world itself, or the internal logic, rather than the designer's logic that we just talked about. So what that means from a lock and key standpoint is that the player is pretty much really explicitly shown what it is that's stopping them and then it's up to them to figure out what items nearby or elements in the environment that will fashion or will be fashioned the key from. And again when it comes to this kind of design the player needs to know that they're doing a puzzle. And I know that doesn't really make sense now but this will be a part of when we get to our second video about puzzle design. But with the Dark Side Detective you are pretty much shown explicitly, okay, I can't go forward, or there's something strange here that I need to get around or do something to. And that clues a player into the lock of the puzzle. And now the key itself, or keys, can take the form of anything within the general environment or in the overall space of that case. Now, when it comes to the idea of the lock and key model, as we talked about before, a major part of this has to do with the concept of puzzle dependency charts. And being able to lay out, okay, well here are my locks that the player must get around, and here are the various keys that the player must use. And when it comes to balancing a puzzle like this, or balancing puzzles, you're able to tweak them based on the number of keys or locks that you want to have. So if a puzzle is too easy, let's say it's just a matter of I pick up a uh, marker, I put it on a painting and we're done, you can make that harder by adding more keys. Maybe the marker is hidden. Maybe it's inside a uh, child's uh, um, a toy box that you have to open up some other way. If something is too hard, you can maybe change the clues around. Maybe give the first key a more explicit area more, or more explicit des description to let you know to start putting things together for a respective lock. But the important thing is that the player m has to be able to understand and extrapolate the solution from within the game space itself. And if they can't do that, then that is a failing on the design and the structure of the puzzle. Now, one thing to keep in mind that is part of its own puzzle design are the use of iterating or refining a solution. These are puzzles that we talk about in more action-oriented games, like the Swapper, Braid, Talos Principle, where it's not about you finding tools in the environment, but about taking what you have and basically just iterating to create the right solution. But that will probably be for our next video. Now, as you can see over the course of this one, that we've been picking up the various items and we're starting to put together the logic of the situation and that will then be, or the player will then hopefully walk that through in their brain, go from A to B to Z, to eventually figure out what the puzzle is and how to get around it. But to begin to wrap things up, again, the lock and key model is an essential part of puzzle design and puzzle philosophy. You have to be able to understand or explain to the player what's stopping them 
and what are the various items or things they can use to get around it. And then from there, it all comes down to playtesting. How can the player figure out what the keys are? Do they understand what it is that's stopping them from getting by? And what that means is, let's say we have a door that's locked, or a door that won't open. Well, there's several way reasons why that door could be locked. Maybe it is the oil on the hinges. The I'm sorry, the hinges are completely rusted and they need to be oiled. Maybe the doorknob's broken off and we need to replace it. Or maybe even the door itself is a monster that we need to go find a magic knife and stab it with to kill the door monster. Again, the player has to be able to grasp what it is they're trying to do, what is stopping them, and what tools do they have available to get around this. And if you can't answer those three questions, then it's just going to make the puzzle a lot more frustrating than it needs to be. But as things begin to wrap up here, for those of you watching, can you think of some examples of lock and key puzzles that just made no freaking sense when you played it? And the mustache cap puzzle doesn't count because we already went over that. But anyway, thanks for watching today's Critical Thought. Like I said, there'll be another video about puzzle design soon. But if you'd like to suggest a topic for me to look at, let me know in the comments below. But check back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom where we examine the art and science of games. Before we get to the credits, just a quick shout out to the supporters over on patreon.com slash gwviser. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to check back for our regular streaming most nights at 9.30-10 EST. And you'll find a schedule linked down below. For a collection of my writings as well as audio casts on design, you'll find that at game-wisdom.com. Be sure to follow me on Twitter at GWBicer. If you're interested in hanging out and talking about game design topics, we have a Discord channel with the basic tier open to everybody, and that is linked down below as well. If you'd like to support us on Patreon, it is at patreon.com slash GWBicer. Your support can help to keep things going and growing, and you can earn rewards such as ad-free versions of our talks, votings for our specific Let's Plays and grab back streams, and more. But that's it for now. Thanks again for watching. I hope you come back for more great discussions on design here and on GameWisdom.com, where we examine the art and science of games.